Hmm. Very good. All right, my friends, welcome to the next episode of the Red Delta Project podcast live stream a q a here on the red delta project youtube channel instagram facebook twitch we're all over the place here i'm matt Shifley, as always helping you escape the diet and exercise rat race by taking a fundamental approach to fitness today's episode is sponsored by the entirety of the resources available over at reddeltaproject.com i'm talking my collection of full on books on amazon as well as pdf including the new adaptive training manual which i'll be referencing several times in today's episode all about how to make adaptive training work for you to get better results with less stress on mind body and lifestyle as well as my new coaching services of course i've got coaching here in person here in denver colorado as well as remote coaching via fortify and my new micro coaching availability which is time and budget friendly if you just want me to kind of help you tweak a program or if you want me to check your technique and stuff, that's available on reddeltaproject.com as well, link down below for all of those resources. So today's episode is all about the results and the outcomes, some surprising, some not so much, on my experiment that I've been running for the past 30 days of taking two exercises, particularly bridges and handstands, and practicing them for at least one set every single day for a month. And the reason why I started doing these is because these have long been exercises. I've just kind of struggled to get under my belt. I've been making progress and I've had little bits and fits and starts and stuff with these things, but I've long had the challenge of feeling comfortable with the exercises. And when we're training, particularly to build muscle and strength and coordination, there's kind of this upward or downward spiral we often get stuck in because we like to do and practice things more that we feel more comfortable doing and we have more proficiency with. Conversely, we also avoid exercises that we don't have that much proficiency and comfort in doing. So that's why we often get stronger and better results with the things that we feel more comfortable with because we're practicing it more so we get better with it, which we may want to, want to practice it more and so on. But the opposite also can happen where you don't feel like doing it, you don't feel comfortable doing it, you're not motivated to do a particular exercise, so you don't get much more proficient and satisfaction out of it, and so you don't practice it as much, and it's a downward spiral. So I was basically trying to reverse the process and the trend by thinking, all right, these are exercises that I haven't made much of a mainstay at several points in my training career, and even when I do practice them, they're almost more of a supplemental exercise in nature. What if I make them a real focus of my daily training? And that's what I did for the past month. And today we're going to be sharing the experience that came along with it. So first and foremost, the biggest lesson that came from it, which uh, exactly what I was expecting, was that I became a lot more comfortable and used to doing the exercises. And that's entirely what I was hoping to accomplish from it. And this was a very important thing to do because your ability to make progress, to build muscle, to get better and safer and stronger and everything you want from the exercise is always based on your level of proficiency with the technique, your level of comfort. How used to it are you? And I know there's that message in our fitness culture that says, oh, you don't want your body used to the exercise. You don't want your body to get used to the workout program because then it'll adapt to that thing. And then the stimulus for change and development will decrease or even outright not exist anymore. And you're going to stop making progress, which I kind of get what they're saying. However, going with this mindset that you don't want to get used to the exercise is entirely false. In fact, I would even go so far as to say the entire point of training is to get as used to the exercise as possible. And the reason for this is very simple. It's because your results are based on how well you can execute an exercise. How good are you at it? And you're not going to get any better at it until you get some degree of comfort and quote, used to the technique as it is. And this isn't just exercise. This is how everything about being a human being works for improvement and growth and development. Think back in school. 
Right? You couldn't learn algebra until you got, quote, used to and comfortable with basic arithmetic. You couldn't read Shakespeare until you got really comfortable with elementary levels of reading. You couldn't jump your bicycle off curbs until you got comfortable just riding down the street. Your ability to make progress and get what you want always depends on how much you get used to doing what you're currently doing. And if you're avoiding that, you're basically just avoiding your own success and progress. Now, of course, if you, for example, took a 10 pound weight and you curled it 15 times and your body got used to that, would the stimulus to get stronger abate? Absolutely. But that's why we have this thing in our fitness culture called progression. So you're like, great, I did that with 15 pounds. Now I'm going to only go lift 20 pounds. And that's what gets you results. But you're not going to be able to lift that 20 until you get used to lifting the 15. And so this whole attitude of we don't want to get used to it, we want to constantly be shocking the body is not at all true. It's steering you completely wrong. The more you get used to the technique, the better off you're going to be in all respects. And that's exactly what's happened to me over the past month. I've gotten a lot more comfortable and a lot more used to any type of inverted handstand work and any type of bridge work. And the results have certainly spoken for themselves. I'm a lot stronger at them. I feel a lot more stability and coordination. Just yesterday, uh, you know, I've never been able to do a full handstand push-up. Part of it is because of my shoulder stability. My right shoulder has long been chronically elevated and protracted, which took the better part of last year and a lot of chiropractic work to start to finally correct it. And it's one of those things that's just held me back, particularly in pushing movements, especially vertical overhead pushing movements for my entire career. It's kept me weak the entire time. It doesn't matter, again, how much you work, how hard you work, what your program is. When you have these chronic misalignments in your body, you're always going to be behind the eight ball. But through that chiropractic work, I learned what I was out of alignment with. I needed to engage my lats more. I needed to get my right lower trap engaged a lot more. And so as a result, now I'm more stable. And we were doing handstand pushups in the class that I was teaching. And even though I can't still quite get to the floor, I'm definitely getting lower. And we were using one of the blue Airx pads for one of my clients as a measurement for how low they can go down and do their handstand push-up, And just totally on a whim, I was like, I wonder if I could do it. Now, granted, a month ago, that would have been almost impossible for me to do. And even if I could even come close, I would say, I feel really uncomfortable on my shoulder about this. But I just popped right up, down to the pad, pushed back up. It was challenging, but it certainly wasn't like blood, sweat, and tears, screaming agony levels of intensity. And I was like, hey, I can do it. And of course, I, I stopped it there because I was coaching the class. I didn't want to just get in a workout or anything. But um, it was one of those things that it was like, this is definitely working. <laughs> this definitely made me a lot stronger because it literally was, I couldn't do something before the month that, uh, began, and now I can do it. And that's proof in the pudding. Today, I also got another piece of evidence uh, about my bridges. Right? Now, bridges are one of these things I've long suffered coordination issues with, uh, being all hunched up and kyphotic, especially for many years, bike racing all hunched up like this. And uh, being hunched up and sitting and stuff is perfectly fine. It's the lack of anything to balance it out that leads us into problems. And that's exactly what happened to me is I never tried to counteract it with anything, any type of extension work, rolling the shoulders back and so on. And it should be no surprise too that Bridges and handstand work are also very synergistic to one another. They complement each other. So if you struggle with one, you're certainly going to struggle with the other, particularly for the shoulder issues I mentioned before. Well, today we had a workshop over at Capra, the bodyweight uh, gym today, and we started talking about bridges. And someone asked me about brig bridging progressions and how would you go about it and stuff. And through the little mini lecture that I was giving, I was just kind of like, Okay, and then, you know, we would go into a back bridge and this is the, the level we'd go with this. And they're like, well, let's see. And I just totally cold, no warm up, no preparation, nothing whatsoever. I just jumped right down on the floor and I did one of the best back bridges I've ever done. 
not after a warm up. Now, back bridges, it used to be one of those things that it would take me forever to get my back and my spine to be at all mobile, to get my glutes to engage, to get my back to be stable, to be able to push up to any degree. And this was cold, no preparation whatsoever. And that bridge that I just hit without any warm up was better than any bridge I had hit before this month long experiment hit. So, again, evidence that this type of approach definitely was bearing some serious fruit. So that shouldn't come as a surprise. You know, when we understand how fitness fundamentally works, then applying things to increase the stimulus on a fundamental level will produce the results that we want. That's one of the benefits of a fundamental approach is it takes a lot of the mystery out of how does this whole exercise thing work? What is going to work best for me? What's going to produce the results? And you just simply understand how to get better results and you just go and do it. So it's certainly been very effective. Now, I'll be answering your questions and everything here a little bit more uh, as well. But uh, one of the things that I really wanted to also reiterate is that I didn't have any sort of a very set program. I used the adaptive approach that I've long been championing. I started using adaptive training several years ago. It's by far one of the best things I've done for my mind, body, and lifestyle, not to mention my results, where I didn't go into each day saying, okay, what's the program? What's the consistency? I have to do uh, you know, bridges for five reps, or I have to be able to do a handstand for 30 seconds, and then I'm going to do these many reps and stuff. No, I was completely adaptive about it. And with an adaptive approach, that means that you practice what you're doing in accordance to your circumstances, your resources, the time and the energy that you have. So sometimes I had more time, more energy, more motivation, and just feeling better physically. So on those days, I was doing more. I was doing more handstands. Sometimes I do two, three, maybe even four sets of something. But there were also days, there was a period where I was actually a little under the weather when I started this experiment and my energy level was really low. My body was stiff and sore and achy and stuff because I was fighting off that cold. So there was a good solid week there where I wasn't really doing much of anything. I would literally sometimes just kick up into a handstand and then come down and be like, okay, there's my set for the day. <laughs> you know. And sometimes I would adjust the technique that I was using instead of like, my full back bridges, I would just simply do hip bridges or maybe with a seriously bent knees like table bridges or something along those lines. The bottom line is that I didn't have a set program. I was always adapting. So in a, in a way, this was almost a little bit of a litmus test for my adaptive training strategies as well. Because when we think of consistency, I saved this little graphic on uh, social media the other day, which labels it very, very well. People think consistency is doing the same thing all the time. If you're doing 100 push-ups every single day, being consistent means you do 100 push-ups every single day, no matter what. But that often actually leads to more inconsistency because you could do 100 push-ups today, get a great pump, feel amazing, and create a great stimulus. And then two days from now, you could do 100 push-ups and you're just stressing out your shoulders and you're burning yourself out and you're killing your motivation. Even though you're consistently doing the same thing, the actual stimulus or the outcome of your training is very different. So it's actually inconsistent to do that. Adaptive training means that you recognize that your circumstances are always changing. So sometimes you should be doing more, sometimes you do less, sometimes you make it more intense, sometimes you make it less intense, sometimes you should do a certain exercise, other times a different exercise may be better. And what that's doing is allowing you to more consistently create the stimulus that you're after, because that's what produces the results you want, not the exercise you do, not the diet you're following, not the program you're on. Can you produce a given stimulus on a consistent basis? And that's a heck of a lot easier, safer, and more comfortable to do when you have an adaptive approach to your fitness habits, because you can work with your circumstances. If you have more time, energy, motivation, physical ability, then you can create a much stronger stimulus and do more. But if you have less, well, just beating yourself into the ground with a lot of extra work isn't going to be the best approach for you. It could be even 
more of a burnout and increasing the risk of injury and those sorts of things. So when you're adjusting and adapting things, it's actually more consistent for the production of the stimulus that you're after. And that's exactly what happened for the last month. So that's been very interesting. Another lesson that came about from my one month exper experiment is recognizing that you know you don't have to bat 100 all the time. You know, there were whole weeks during that month where I just felt like I wasn't making a whole lot of progress. Like things were not really improving that much. Things felt about the same. And there were several days I'm like, I don't know if this is working. I don't know if this is maybe uh, producing any sort of uh, effect. Maybe some days I'd be even st stiffer or tighter or feeling a little weaker and like maybe it's working against. So when I got more fixated on the acute variables and acute changes on a day-to-day -day basis, that's when the little demon started creeping up on my shoulder and being like, I don't know about this. I don't think you're making any progress. And the mistake I would have made is been like, you're right, this isn't working because I've had a few bad days. This program sucks. I'm going to find something else. But instead, I just kind of stuck with it and I adapted my training approaches accordingly, as, as I do. And undeniably, the end result, the long-term result has been extremely positive, very, very much so. So the lesson there, especially for those who are just starting out, is that you're going to have periods where it feels like things are not working very well or at all. You're going to have these stretches of time where you're going to have the self-doubts, where you're going to feel like, I don't know if what I'm doing is really that productive. And that's perfectly fine. That's going to happen. You're never going to have an approach to diet and exercise that's like, oh yeah, this is always very effective and it's always rewarding and it's always productive and it's always getting results and it's always good. It's not going to happen. You're never going to have that. You're going to have off days. You're going to have off weeks. Hell, if your training career lasts long enough, hopefully it does, you're going to have off months and even off years. But being able to continuously still make headway where you can is the key to keep moving forward. When we get derailed and we think, okay, this is, hasn't worked for the past week. You know, I haven't lost any weight in the past few days or my weight even may be up or I feel weak on this exercise or whatever for a few weeks, that's going to happen. There's a lot of influences and circumstances that are going to influence your outcomes from your workouts on a day-to-day -day basis and a week-to-week -week basis. And a lot of them have nothing to do with diet and exercise. It's just life happens. But when we keep just chipping away and moving forward and doing what we can, that still leaves you with the possibility of progress. But when we're constantly rearranging, <coughs> excuse me, our program, second guessing the program, second guessing the plan, second guessing ourselves and thinking to ourselves, I don't think this is doing anything. I don't think this is working. That's when we run into serious problems. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you should just keep plowing on ahead crossing your fingers and assuming it's going to work in the long run, because that also can lead to problems. There are many times I've known people in some of the big mega gyms that I used to work at and stuff. And you talk to them and they're like, yep, I've been working out here for three solid years and they're still lifting the same weights. They're still doing the same program. They're still working with the same body. They're still working at the same level of fitness. They're still at the same weight. Like, Obviously, change should be happening in the long run, but oftentimes we think that a lack of acute change means there's going to be a lack of uh, long-term change, and opposites can sometimes happen as well. We see an acute change where we're like, oh my gosh, my weight dropped three pounds in the past 24 hours. This new program is working, when in reality, it doesn't mean that at all. It's just a change in water weight because it got hotter out or something, or you could have just a great day in the gym for whatever reason, the stars align and you're super strong. And so you break all these PRs, but then you don't get to that level again for the next six weeks. You think, oh my gosh, something's terribly wrong. It's like, no, you had a blip on the radar in one direction or the other. It doesn't necessarily mean anything actually happened. So what do we do about these sorts of things? How do we prevent these derailments from happening? Well, the last month, you know, it, does come with a combination of, you know, stay on target kind of thing. Just keep 
making some sort of moves on a regular basis, but use adaptation so that way you're not beating yourself up on it, but you're also going with more things when, if, when you can. But more importantly, you're still working on progression in your mind. You're still trying to chip away and improve things when and where you can. I did every single repetition and every workout I did over the past month, focusing not on just getting the work done. You know, okay, here's my handstands for the day. Here are my bridges for the day. No, every single time I'm like, all right, how am I focusing on utilizing my body better with this? What am I trying to improve? With bridges, it was often like I'm trying to increase my range of tension in my glutes and hamstrings. That made a hell of a difference. I mean, right now, my bridges feel entirely different than they did a month ago because I'm engaging and utilizing my hamstrings to a much higher level right now. So just that, just that little thing of keep your glutes and hamstrings tense at the bottom of the bridge so they're engaged all the way to the top, huge difference, huge. Right? Same thing with the handstands. Where's my weight distribution? Am I packing my uh, or um, keeping my shoulders uh, square? Am I using my glutes and my abs when I'm doing the handstands? When I do do the handstand push-ups, am I able to effectively uh, stabilize in my back and my core? All these little things, you know, what are you trying to do? What are you working on? That's the thing you do to chip away at the progress. We don't want to make the mistake of thinking that the results are gonna come if we just put in the work. It's certainly possible to put in a lot of work and effort over a good period of time and still not have much to show for it. Happens all the time, Happens to has happened to me many years over the course of my 20 plus training career. So we wanna still be chipping away. It's like, I'm still trying to do this thing better. I'm still trying to improve. And it could be as simple as trying to keep my feet closer together when I'm doing the handstand work, having less pressure on the wall, having more stability on my hands, you know, all these little technical details, they really add up. Um, other things that we may or may not have, have noticed is the ability to like, did you build muscle? I know a lot of people are probably asking that, like, did you build muscle? Were you able to change your physique aesthetically? Well, I mean, at this stage in my training career, I mean, I've been doing this over 20 years and I'm 46 now, it's going to take an act of Congress to make any sort of changes happen at that point, uh, just because you're going to utilize a large portion of your physiological adaptation for aesthetics at the first several years of your training career. And that's not to say you can't make progress. Of course you can, but it's certainly going to be a lot slower, especially as you get older and as especially as your training age, if you will, uh, progresses as well. And so a month in, no, I'm not expecting hardly anything to happen. It's only been a month. Uh, but if I do say so, I do feel like my shoulders are, I don't know, it's feeling like they fill out my shirt a little bit more. It's, it's more of a feeling, like I feel my shoulder size a little bit more. And it's probably just engaging my, my shoulders better with everything else that I'm doing. But I want to say that my shoulders are a little bit bigger, largely because they are not really utilizing a large degree of their capacity to grow to begin with. Uh, because of the aforementioned shoulder issues that I had beforehand. So I'm sure there's a lot more potential for my shoulders to grow than most other parts of my body. So I'm probably going to be making more progress and building up my shoulders over the next six months or so, uh, just because there's probably more untapped stuff there as I get better with it. But yeah, six, uh, 30 days, unless you're really new to strength training, uh, unless you've got a good you know, degree of environmental factors, like you're eating plenty of food, you're getting plenty of good sleep, you're managing stress. That's the other thing is I've been stressed to the nines for the past year, battling a lot of anxiety and stuff. It's not going to be easy uh, for me under the best of times to put on anything uh, as far as muscle. I've just got many things working against me, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. But if you've got much better circumstances than I do, uh, like age and your training age and all the things, it, you'll probably see some degree of change maybe in, in a month. You know, Month really isn't that long for building muscle. We often think that building muscle happens at the same rate and speed as like putting on or losing body fat. And that's certainly not the case. Uh, you'll gain or lose body fat at a much faster rate than building or losing muscle in most cases. Let's get to some questions here. Folks are coming on in. 
Alex A is saying, hey Matt, do you use a power meter when biking? Not when I'm actually on the bike itself. Uh, power meters became a lot more prevalent after my racing career. And uh, I have used them a lot on exercise bikes. We, I used to teach a class that used power meters with your FTP threshold and everything like that. Uh, I certainly think it's a vital piece of equipment for stationary bikes, for sure, because that gives you quantifiable measurement of, well, your power output. You know, not knowing your power output when you're riding a bike uh, can be equivalent to not knowing how much resistance that you're working against. But with a regular actual bike, I think it's not quite as important because you're also having like speed that you can go on. When I go up Lookout Mountain and it's for a new personal best time, I know I'm producing a lot more power just because I went from A to B a lot faster. So usually when I'm on the bike, I will use just a simple stopwatch uh, on things or, or Strava, you know, sometimes if I've got a dedicated route, because if you did it faster, well, then chances are you had more power output or you had a really good tailwind sometimes. Uh, but when it comes to the exercise bike, uh, things like the, um, the, the in-flight systems and stuff that we used to use, very, very handy to know and good for programming as well. Christina Smith, good to talk to you. I hear that progress is more about a feeling I'm able to do better quality reps. And it's important, like a lot of times we overvalue quantifiable metrics. Things like how many reps can you do and how much weight can you lift or how much uh, weight have you lost and things like that. And that stuff is really important. It's really good. But I think some coaches out there will have this idea of like, if you can't quantify it, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't give you any sort of thing that you can do. But there's a couple of problems with that. One, and I, I keep meaning to look this up, there's some sort of a law about basic human psychology and nature is that when a quantifiable metric of progress becomes the goal, it's no longer a reliable quantification metric of progress. So you, you hear about this all the time in economic textbooks and stuff where the classic example was a nail factory. And they were like, okay, so we want to double our production of how many nails we can do. So the metric that they were trying to uh, make the goal is can we have instead of 500 nails a day, can we do a thousand nails a day? And they made that metric happen. They beat, they got to that, but all the nails were bent and they were missing points and they were low quality metal and things like that. Because when that quantifiable metric became the goal, everything else suffered for the sake of reaching that goal. Okay? And so a lot of times when we're like, if you can't measure it, then it doesn't matter. Yeah, but you gotta be careful about making a single metric your goal because you could sacrifice, it happens all the time in the calisthenics world. Guys who are like, I, the only thing that matters is how much volume I do or how many pushups I can do. And they'll be like, yeah, I do like 500 pushups a day or something. And then I took a look at their pushup. I'm like, man, your technique is terrible. Like this is not a sound way to build muscle and strength. It's like, because we subconsciously have eroded the range of motion and we're using momentum and we're basically taking all these technical shortcuts to get that number up because we think that number is the single thing that's most important as a sign of our progress. And this is just everything with diet, exercise, business, economics. It's, it's just the way it is. We don't want to become too fixated on one thing. But as I was alluding to here, as you were saying, Christina, like there's a lot of um, subjective variables too towards making progress. And a lot of times we're probably going to make more progress improving some of these subjective things. Like I've been a martial artist since I was 10 years old. I've never quantified anything <laughs> other than maybe how many classes I attend in a week. But my sidekicks are better. My punches are better. You know, when I uh, tested for my sixth degree black belt last November, and one of the uh, uh, pieces of feedback that I got from the testing board, funny enough, you know, this is something that I've long heard is you're just too tense, Matt. You've got too much tension. You need to relax. So the past several weeks, especially, I've been like, all right, fine. I'm tired of being so tense. I'm tired of being gassed out after 30 seconds and free sparring and stuff. I'm going to work on relaxing more. And so when I'm practicing my patterns, when I'm practicing my kicks, when I'm just simply standing there in my fighting stance while doing basics, I'm purposely trying to make myself just relax a little bit more. 
Now, do I have a quantifiable number for that relaxation or how much tension is in my muscles? No. But is it different than what it was before? Am I more relaxed? Yes. And that's all that matters. Because remember, what we need in order to make progress is to create a delta in our experience. It needs to look different. It needs to feel different. It needs to perform different. Metrics are great, especially when you're really getting into the fine tuning things. If I was a hundred yard sprinter, then yeah, I'd want a metric that is very accurate for time because I'm pretty confident that if I ran a hundred meters regularly for 0.25 seconds faster, I, I don't know if I could really know that, if I could really feel that, but the quantification of very accurate timing would tell me that, yeah, you're definitely getting a little faster. Great. Awesome. But at the same time, I may be like, yeah, now I feel like I'm not pounding into the ground with as much impact. I'm much smoother, or I'm able to run and um, feel looser in my legs. It doesn't feel exhausted as exhausted when I'm done. So we always need both. We need quantifiable metrics, but we don't ever want to make a single quantifiable metric the be all end all of our progress. And we also want to pay attention to subjective variables as well. The more we collectively focus on when making progress, the more progress you're going to make. And that was certainly what I've been doing over the past month. I've been thinking of technique, tension control, range of motion, repetitions, uh, energy. You know, again, the, I was in the bridge this morning, cold, no warm up. And I just got up onto that bridge and I was like, oh, wow that feels a heck of a lot better than it ever has been before. I'm definitely getting more extension or flexion in my shoulders. I'm definitely feeling this more along my back and not crunching my lower back. That alone is proof positive that the experiment has been working, even though I may not be able to attach a number to it. Very good, Christina. Thank you very much for the comment. Ryan Webb coming on saying, I could be wrong, but it might be the law of induced demand, which I've heard a lot in traffic studies of places, but the idea, what you said, the numbers don't tell the whole story. Exactly. But we don't want to make the mistake of thinking, oh, the numbers don't matter. You know, you, you get that from a lot of uh, weight uh, and weight management gurus, myself included for years. They're like, don't listen to the scale, get off the scale, throw away your scale and stuff. The fact is the scale can be a useful metric. It can be a useful tool, but we have to use it in a smart, and holistic approach. We have to take more into account than what is my weight. Instead, we also want to, if, especially if you're looking for aesthetic changes in your body, then look at yourself in the mirror too. You know, it's like, I'm losing weight, I'm losing weight. Well, what is it the image staring back in the mirror look like? How do your clothes fit? You know, how does your energy happen? It happens all the time where people will come to me and they're like, I don't think my weight loss program is working. I don't think this diet or workout program is working. And it's like, well, what do you think? Well, the numbers on the scale aren't really changing very much. But then I'll go through a number of other things to assess. It's like, well, you're getting stronger. Your energy level is going up. Your appetite regulation is much better. You're sleeping a lot better. You have a lot less anxiety over food. You're uh, able to satisfy your hunger more. You've got uh, more endurance when you're doing your workouts and yada, yada, on and on and on. Your clothes are fitting better and stuff. So when you've got all of these things, objective and subjective metrics, all pointing to you saying, this is really effective, it's going great, but you put your focus on one single variable and that doesn't seem to be changing much. Well, then you're ignoring all this wonderful stuff. And isn't that the way we often do it as human beings, right? This past year for, again, my personal example, I've been having a real hard emotional time with a bunch of things. Uh, well, actually with a single thing that's been going on, causing me a lot of stress and anxiety on a daily basis. But, and I was talking to my therapist about this. I'm like, but it doesn't make sense because on paper, everything else about my life has been going gangbusters. Like you, people would look at my life with the metrics that I've been hitting and everything, both arbitrary and or, uh, subjective and objective. And they'd be like, dude, you are absolutely crushing your life. I'm like, then why am I waking up every morning feeling so miserable? Is we love to focus on that negative thing. We love to focus on that one thing that we just get emotionally fixated on. And that has been a big lesson 
from the past month of the single set per week is that it's not so much about you know physically feeling more comfortable with the exercises but emotionally more comfortable with it because remember we humans we are fundamentally emotional creatures that was why i wrote entire chapters in my latest book addressing this is that we have to have uh, attention on the emotional side of diet and exercise to ignore that is a grave mistake and so that's why how you feel about what you're doing is vitally important and through doing these exercises on a more frequent basis i'm not nearly as timid about them i'm not nearly as feeling like they're a mountain i've got to climb like back in the uh, before this experiment to get up into a handstand to kick up into a handstand it would be like okay i gotta really oof, all right, here we go. Slap, slap, you know, in the face. All right, kind of got to pump myself up. This is going to be hard. It's so awkward. It's so weird for me to kick up into a handstand and stuff. It was always really weird for me to do. Never comfortable, never liked doing it very much. Usually a little bit of avoidant behaviors. Like, oh, it's time to do my handstand work. First, I'll check my email. First, I'll do the laundry. First, I'll do this, you know, kind of thing. Now, you know, I'll do a handstand against the wall and there's like very little emotional friction there inside, internally. And whenever we can remove emotional friction towards the habits we should be doing in order to get things, we are majorly winning. If nothing else, if that was the one benefit, <coughs> excuse me, very dry out. If that was the one benefit I got from this uh, month, then I would consider it a raving success. But of course, I've had many more benefits to that as well. So that alone means that things have been working extremely well. Joseph Bello, it's good to see you, my friend. Hello, Matt. I do pike push-ups in my workout. Very good. Love pike push-ups. I'm having trouble doing them. I'm not sure if I'm doing them right on the way down to the floor, and I struggle as I get close to the floor. Okay. Further uh, saying, hello, Matt. Not sure if my elbows are supposed to be in close or a little out at an angle. Very good, Joseph. You can do it both ways. Uh, generally, when people start doing bike push-ups and push-ups in general, uh, there's a tendency to flare the elbows out a bit. And I'm usually more forgiving of that when people are starting something new or they have a new high level of resistance. Like when I'm doing my actual full body weight handstand push-ups, I'm sure my elbows are out flaring out a lot more than I would personally like. But that's a progression that we can have. As a centerline principle, as I discuss in my book, Smart Body Weight Training, the more you pull things into your center line, the harder it's going to be. So you can be flared out a bit, perfectly fine. It's okay. You can even have your fingertips pointing for, uh, inwards just a bit to make it more ergonomic on the wrists. But do try to pull it in a little bit, particularly with the muscles in your back for more stability in your shoulders. And especially when you get much closer with your hands, like usually people will go with pike push-ups and they'll try to immediately go into handstand push-ups. Usually I'm a big fan of close hand pike push-ups. It's the same kind of progression we have with regular push-ups, works real well with pike push-ups. And for that, you're definitely going to want your hands in very close as well. But, you know, take, take advantage, Joseph, uh, again, of the, the micro coaching at reddeltaproject.com. If you want to send me some videos, have me look at it, uh, I could take a look at your technique and uh, see if there's some glaring things that can show up. But you know, we're talking about progress here being sometimes a, of a subjective nature too, folks. One of the best things you can do for self-coaching that can really be enlightening and clue you into a lot is just simple self-observation. I was talking with a, a friend of mine the other day about this, about how so much of the things we need to improve upon are our subliminal habits of how we act on a daily basis, how we talk, how we breathe, and so on. And he said, it's amazing how we feel so uncomfortable recording ourselves, video or audio or something, because it's kind of shocking. It's like, that's what I sound like? That's what I really look like? Oh, my goodness. And if you've got the guts to be able to overcome that, record yourself on your smartphone there and watch the playback. Because watching yourself, as Yogi Bear always said, you can observe a lot by watching <laughs> you will probably see a lot of potential for improvement just by watching yourself in a 10 second video. Uh, I have a, we don't have, that's why we have mirrors and gyms and stuff. When you can see yourself, 
I have a technique that I use on uh, for the bodyweight gym where uh, the Apple uh, iPhone and the uh, laptops, they have this screen sharing kind of feature to or screen mirroring, I think it is. So whatever's on your phone is actually also on your laptop screen. So if someone's doing an exercise where they can't see a mirror or something, I'll position my laptop where they can see the laptop while they're doing the exercise. And then I'll do the screen mirroring and turn the camera on on my phone. And then I can point the camera at them as they're doing the exercise and I can get the front, I can get the side, I can get the back, I can get the top, all these different angles, but they're watching what the camera sees on my laptop so they can watch their technique from all these different angles. Very telling, very enlightening. And you learn real fast there. It's like, oh my gosh, that's what my shoulders are doing? Oh my gosh, that's where my hips, are. oh wow. And progress is made very quickly with that. So little tech tip there. Uh, I'm sure there's ways to do that with, Android phones and Windows computers and stuff like that, but it's a it's a standard thing for Apple. Cristobal, it's good to see you. Saying, hey Matt, what's your opinion on the Dr. Stuart McGill pull-up method? Doing multiple sets of two reps with maximum effort, resting 20 seconds. Is that so? I get a lot of questions on things about about stuff like this, and I'm going to be addressing blanketly what these sorts of things are in next week's episode, where I'm addressing volume. Uh, basically, like myths of volume, uh, facts, truths, misconceptions, that sort of thing. So I get a lot of different uh, questions about different volume approaches. And the fact of the matter is that uh, the volume isn't so much important as what kind of stimulus you're trying to create. So his approach here, you know, when you've got something that's relatively low repetition like that, it's very high intensity. High intensity is low volume or repetition per set, volume per set, but you can do lots of different uh, sets because uh, you're not very many reps there. But uh, when you're talking maximum effort, are we talking with weight vests? Are we talking progressive technique? Um, you know, why is it maximum effort? Are we blasting up as hard as we possibly can? So it's basically a high intensity training is what it is. You're doing two repetitions, so there you go. And then just rest as needed from that sort of thing. So it's just high intensity training, been around forever, lots of different ways to approach it. It's just high intensity training uh, that we're utilizing. And it's one of those things that, uh, great. Yeah, high intensity is gonna give you the benefits of high intensity training. High levels of tension in the muscle, power, explosiveness, uh, that sort of thing. High intensity training produces the stimulus of high intensity stimuli. And that's all it is. It's nothing fancy or special outside of that, which it can be very effective if that's what you need for the results that you're after. Ben Ben saying, hey Matt, do you think body weight is enough to build good legs? If it's not, you're doing something wrong. So I, I get this question a, a heck of a lot and I understand where it's coming from. Back in the day when I used to sell weight machines, I was obsessed with making sure that if I was gonna look into buying a weight machine, that the weight stacks could get heavy enough. Like, oh, that weight stack goes up to 150 pounds. I don't think that's gonna be enough resistance. I don't wanna be limited to uh, what I can do with this, with my potential. Never mind the fact that I probably wouldn't lift 150 pounds on some of those machines because of how the pulleys are and everything. But I always much preferred like plate-loaded weight stacks and plate-loaded mechanisms because it's like, I can put a, you know, 800 pounds on it. Great, awesome, like I would ever need that. But I never wanted to be limited. So when it comes to legs for leg training, for the body weight stuff, is there a limit? Absolutely. Are you going to hit it? Chances are no. Chances are you're not going to get even close to it. There are some people who will get there, but you know it's one of those things of there's lots of potential to keep moving forward if you know how to progress it. Yeah, yeah, I get lots of folks out there going like, oh, you know, I get 10 pistol squats and now I'm maxed out and their pistol squat looks like crap and they're compensating all over the place and they're bouncing out of it and they're using all sorts of issues with this. It's like, no, dude, you're, you're not even close to, you know, getting a pistol squat there. I mean, you can do it, but you're not even close to a higher level of it. And there's always a higher level that you can do with many types of bodyweight techniques. Plus there's leverage of specific uh, techniques as well. We were, again, in the workshop that I attended this morning, we were in a simple isometric and the exercise was given as a 
very simple like way to stabilize the hip, but it was basically a progressive sissy squat isometric. And everybody's like, I can maybe hold this position before my quads give out in 15 seconds, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds with practice and training. And so we're doing this with pure body weight. And most guys can't hold that position because their quads are not strong enough for more than 15 seconds. So there are advanced techniques. There are things that are much more pro uh, progressive. So what you're really asking is, is it limited? Yes, everything has a limit. You can only put so much weight on a barbell after all. But more, more time than others, the limitations in your proficiency and your understanding of how to use it. And my legs are a hell of a lot better than with body weight than they ever were with weights. By far, by far, I've actually got muscle tone now in my quads. I've got, you can see my rectus femoris when I flex my quads. Never had that when I was on leg presses and back squats. Now, again, is that because of calisthenics? No, that's because of me, you know, and my ability to use my legs better. And that's really what it boils down to. The method that you use really isn't that important for getting results. All you need is progressive resistance on the muscles. If your method supplies enough progressive resistance that it can challenge you, then it's sufficient. It's enough. And if there's levels out there that's like, yeah, this is going to be even harder and harder and harder and harder, then it's always going to be enough. Now, if you have a very high level of proficiency and strength and stuff, and you need like weighted pistols or whatever, then go with that. But it's much more dependent on you. And the actual method you use isn't really that important. And uh, that's going to be much more uh, of a, a litmus test is the person practicing it rather than the actual thing. Jonah Bettison, Bet sorry, Jonah Bettison saying, hey Matt, I still got my shoulders back down retracted at the bottom of push-up. You know, I fully focus on the movement. Do you have any advice for me, please? Yeah, it's going to take some practice. So back activation is just hard for a lot of folks, especially the coordination of it during push-ups, just because you're pushing, but you're also kind of pulling. It's, it's kind of weird in that regard. So start your push-ups in the bottom position, roll the shoulders down and back. And then when you do your push-up, you push up, shoulders come up and forward. And then when you come down, it helps to move your body forward slightly, rock forward on your toes. So that way you can kind of feel your shoulders pull back, keep the arms in nice and tight. Dips are a good way to do this. Reverse uh, shrugs, like basically you're on a dip bar and you're doing reverse shrugs like this. You're pushing yourself up uh, in a dip position. It's good for that. Basically, it's just getting the muscles to engage stronger and having more coordination with them. And it just takes practice. It just simply takes practice and you want to practice that with lots of different things too. Don't just practice keeping the shoulders down and back or moving the shoulders down and back with your push-ups. Apply this to some degree in most every exercise you do. It's not prevalent or uh, recommended in everything. You know, To some degree, there are exercises that may not need it, but tricep extensions, bicep curls, pull downs, rows, basically most everything practice that scapular retraction pulling down on a very frequent basis because it is really a, a skill that is practiced and if you're only doing it when you're doing your push-ups you're probably missing out on a lot of practice opportunity there <clears throat> Luray is saying hey matt how worried about butt wink oh we covered this in the workout today or in the, the workshop today one have to be when squatting etc i'm trying to work on my deep squat but all talk of butt wink make me paranoid to get down there when doing it. So a couple of things, you know, first and foremost, if you've got a load on your back, then yes, it's a problem uh, because you're loading your spine in a flex position, which can be you know, a little bit of a like, oh, I don't know quite about this. And I know it's like you got the power lifter out there who's been squatting for 80 years and he's like, I'm fine because of it, but never use one single person as a data point for what's good or bad when it comes to fitness. Uh, but for the most part, butt wink is perfectly fine and normal especially when you're not loaded uh, for uh, body weight style training. So if there's no load on your spine, move your spine however you like. Uh, that's, it's that simple. The spine is a joint. It's healthiest when it's moving. We have a lot of rules in our fitness culture about locking the spine in place. Don't move the spine. And in certain circumstances, yes, that's good advice. But like any other joint, if you just never really move it, 
or work it through a range of motion, it's not good for the joints. It's just uh, more healthy through movement. So in that regard, you could almost make the argument that the butt wing is good for your back because it's moving it through. But yeah, you want to increase your range of motion in the back of your hips so it decreases over time, more just anything from a comfort level and also just from a proficiency standpoint too. When you're doing pistol squats and you got the butt wing, you basically have your glute and your hamstring muscles pulling you backwards and it's really hard and awkward to do the exercise. So getting back to what we were talking about with body weight leg training, a lot of people are held back in their ability to sufficiently train their legs because they lack stability and mobility in their hips and their lower body. And therefore they lack the ability to adequately train their legs because you need all three of those. You need strength and stability and mobility. And because most of us have very poor mobility and stability in our hips, we just have trouble accessing an adequate level of resistance in our lower body with progressive leg training. And then we just jump on the leg press or use, you know, half squats and things like that to say, well, now I can get a lot of resistance. Like, yeah, but you're also sweeping the other problems kind of underneath the rug. So for the most part, don't worry about it, but do keep working on alleviating it. Keep some tension in your glutes. Let that stretch happen. Practice shifting squats back and forth, really deep lunges. Those sorts of things are just basic hip mobility exercises that go a long way at minimizing or shortening up, not because it's bad or dangerous. It's just, you're going to have a lot easier time sufficiently training your legs. Plus you'll have better stability and mobility when you just have less butt wink. So it's not unsafe, mind you, but it is kind of a pain in the neck to have. It's kind of like shoulder mobility with pull-ups. If you can't get your arm all the way flexed and all the way up, it's going to hold back your ability to get what you want out of your pull-up training. Sure, if you never get that mobility, you're probably fine, but why leave progress on the table? So in closing, folks, let's ask the question I think a lot of people start asking. Whenever someone out there does some little experiment, like I ate nothing but French fries for an entire month, and this is what happened and stuff, you know, and Again, people are asking me, what do you think about this guy's program? What do you think about that person's program? And so on. What they're really asking is, is this something I should be doing? <laughs> is this something that I need to do? Or am I missing out if I don't do this and we get like FOMO and things like that? So when it comes to practicing an exercise every day for a month, is this right for you? Well, I would say that if you've got a type of exercise or a technique or something out there, that you're just struggling to get used to or get comfortable with, then yeah, it may be something to try out. It may be good for you. I've done it many times with clients where they'll have that one exercise that is just a bugaboo for them, no matter what. And say, just do it every single day for a month. And at the end of the month, they're like, oh, now it's my favorite exercise because they just got more used to it. Again, I recommend an adaptive approach where some days you're doing more of it. Some days you're doing less of it. You're not necessarily always going and driving yourself into the ground and sitting trying to work yourself into oblivion with it. Uh, sometimes I would do much more volume. I would still occasionally have a full on workout where I would do you know, five sets of handstand pushups or bridges for a good 15 minutes. So it's not like I only did one set a day. And that was all I did for this. Sometimes I would do a lot more. Absolutely. I'd do full on workouts of these things when the time and the energy and the motivation allowed, but having that adaptive approach makes it work better for you rather than having a very strict, this is exactly how you do it every single day, or this is how many you should do on Monday and Wednesday and Friday and all these sorts of things. Just do it at all. Because one of the great things about practice is long as you've got that progressive mindset of trying to improve your proficiency and trying to improve little bits and pieces here. And again, you'll get a lot of feedback if you watch yourself on video, uh, then yeah, it can do wonderful things for you. I personally plan on keeping up with these sorts of things. I've been making great progress with my bridges and handstands from practicing a month uh, for every day for a month. I see no reason to stop. You know, that's always the thing that kind of made me scratch my head. There's challenges out there, diet and exercise challenges where people are like, oh, I did this and I got great results. It's like, well, if it was so great, then why aren't you still doing it? 
the real actual litmus test of how great or effective a particular diet program or workout is or anything is, are you still doing it? Now, granted, of course, there are some things that are not meant to be done long term. You know, bodybuilder or figure competitor who's doing a diet to cut for a specific competition event, that's not meant to be done all the time. And they'll certainly admit to that as well. They'll be like, I only need to do this up until the competition. And then I'm going to scale back and not do it nearly to that degree. But something that's relatively low key, low maintenance like this, if it's working great for you, keep going. One of the biggest mistakes that I see people make when it comes to their consistency in making long-term progress is they'll make some degree of progress with what they're doing and then they'll get FOMO or they'll hear all about this great new program or whatever out there and they'll take what's actually working and providing some sort of relatively consistent results and they'll scrap it and they'll just try something completely different and new. And that's a huge mistake. In most of the time, there's a lot of different diets out there, a lot of different workout programs. There's lots of different approaches. And for the most part, it's all just different ways of making the same applesauce. If you're going with high intensity, low volume stuff, does it matter if you're doing like five sets of two or six sets of three or resting 20 seconds or 60 seconds? You know, it's little technical details usually. We're just changing the flavor of the approach. It's not really going to matter all that much. So as long as you're creating the same general fundamental stimulus in your workout, the details really aren't all that important. You're still going to get the same general result. But the details do matter if they matter to you. If for, if for some reason you're like, I don't know why, I just feel better if I use dumbbells instead of bands or whatever, then you go with that. Because so much of what's going to work best is what works best for you and helps pull you into personal alignment. It's not the science of the program, which is important, but it's not hard to achieve that. It's not the, the data or anything like that. It's really about, well, what works, what do you feel best doing? What works best for you? I could have probably improved my handstand and bridges a hundred different ways, a hundred different programs. And I would have gotten the same result with all of them. But I did the daily thing just because in my mind, I'm like, well, that seems like something I can stick to. That certainly seems like it'd be a fun little thing to do. That seems like it would be something that would make me feel good over time. Okay, that's why I'm going to do this. No other reason than that. It just is based more on personal preference because when it comes down to effective diet and exercise habits, all you need is that fundamental stimulus to influence that fundamental process that I talk about in my latest book, Be Fit and Live Free. That's all it needs to do to have the effectiveness. And then the effectiveness for you just boils down to largely preference. Do you like to do this? Is it something you enjoy doing? Is it something you have an easier time doing? Always remember, my friends, that when it comes down to our habits, easier is better. Whatever is just the easiest way for you to stick to it is going to be the better way to go. So with those parting words of, well, I don't know about wisdom, but certainly thoughts, I will leave you, uh, bid you adieu. Don't forget, check out the resources that I was talking about in today's episode at reddeltaproject.com, including my new micro coaching, remote coaching, and of course, the new quick read that I just published last week, all about my ultimate guide to adaptive fitness habits for better results with less stress on mind, body, and lifestyle. I will talk to you folks next week where I will talk about myths, truths, facts, and best ways to adjust, adapt, and use the correct amount of volume for your progress that you want, again, for better results and less stress. Hope you have a great weekend. I'll talk to you then. Be fit and live free.